think of my customers, and I, um, I love my customers, my readers, and so it's great. But in terms of public speaking and that, I stopped doing it as much. I think people got tired of me on stage, so I, I don't <laughs> think so. But I do my events, and I come out occasionally for good customers. Thank you. So on behalf of everyone, thank you. Thank you for being here. So uh, how about if we kick off with, uh, there's a lot of fake news out there. Does everybody agree? <laughs> right, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, I think there, um, I mean, journalism, not journalism, but publishing became very democratic uh, with the internet, particularly with blogs, and so anybody, no matter how ill-informed, could begin to publish a blog, and then with social media, anyone could say anything anywhere, and they, in effect, became publishers, and so there was no editing, there was no accountability, no responsibility, and so I think news media became, in a lot of people's minds, dubious, and for some unbelievable, and they lost all trust. Um, but even mainstream media um, has gotten itself in a lot of jams lately, and uh, they do have a hierarchy of editing, but they seem in some cases to have a point of view, and that point of view people are increasingly suspect of and cynical about. I'm an old school journalist, which is pretty simple. Um, tell, tell us about yourself. Well, first is our duty to our readers, and in um, this particular, I've been in the media and content business um, my whole life. I, I started out as a uh, sports writer in high school for the local newspaper. I got randomly picked by the superintendent. I was a little bit of a rut. I love sports. My dad uh, read two newspapers a day. He loved journalism. Um, this is back in the day when the daily newspaper had a poem, poem, poetry on the cover of the newspaper as opposed to, you know, a celebrity. It was a different time. And mainstream America used to read more and be more informed and more intelligent. And uh, old school journalism was you report and you do your best to cover all sides, and if it is an opinion, you publish it as an opinion. Kind of like the Wall Street Journal, if you look at it as an opinion section, and the rest is news. And so, and you have editors, and if you make a mistake, you correct it, and, um, but you fight and push back if people try to get you to remove stories, uh, if they're factually correct. Um, our writers every day wake up in the morning and have one duty, and that's to all of you, our readers. We make mistakes, we try to correct them. I have a point of view, and I publish an opinion piece twice a month, um, but our reporters every day, they don't have an angle, they don't have an agenda. Um, the vision of Inman though, is pretty simple, which is uh, we're trying to raise the real estate I IQ, but we're also trying to help change and improve the real estate industry to create a better consumer experience. And that's been our vision for 20 years. And uh, just some background here, um, none of our reporters can own stock uh, or ownership in any companies. Our contributing writers, which are from the industry, uh, it's a requirement they disclose any relationships they have. No one owns any piece of Inman except me. Um, and I don't own stock in any real estate related company or venture. And what that does, could probably gotten richer if we'd done something differently, um, is you can't pay to be in the Inman News Hole unless you're an advertising paying for what's called paid content, which is clearly identified. And we try to stay ethical. Now, at the beginning, that was hard, but now we've kind of dusted a, you know, some of our competitors because what people do want now is a degree of integrity, they want the news when it happens, they want business intelligence, um, they want to know what's happening. And if you read the comment below in the stories, they're also very opinionated, um, often throw a lot of shit my way, and uh, tour, but I, yeah, I've been getting that my whole life. I, in the 1980s, I wrote about environmentalism and development for papers like the LA Times, and I would get death threats, but they came by snail mail, not by email. And so it, that just comes with the territory. Um, and you know, there's a vigorous debate, even with the allegations about fake news. I've never seen Americans more engaged, and nothing could be better in a democratic society when people are 
fully engaged and feel um, secure in proffering their opinions and yelling and screaming and debating and it could be more polite and more civilized but absent, you know, let's take other countries where journalists are killed, you know, literally assassinated. Uh, other countries where the news media is censored, like China. Other countries where there isn't something called the First Amendment and there isn't a, a constitution that's upheld and dictators uh, you know, put journalists and academics in jail and prison and are tortured you never hear from them again. We live in a country where the First Amendment's valued and people can speak their mind. And that's, you know, sunshine is critical. These politicians get away with murder unless there's sunshine on them. So um, we got some things that are broken here, but we also have, a, in my opinion, some basic things that work very well. Thank you for sharing your background and your opinions and uh, clarifying some of those points. I think yeah. that's really important for the audience here. So thank you. Um, and by the way, we should let someone here rip, rip me a new one over some Well, that's something later. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, please start formulating your, uh, your questions. I'll be out there in a little bit. So good, Brett. Um, you are the number one specialized news source in our business. And so I just want to quickly mention in front of everyone, from one entrepreneur to another, congratulations on all your success. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for all of us. Keep that Thank you. It's a hard industry to keep up with. It's so colorful, and there's so much happening. And in the 30 years that I've covered it, I've never, never is there been a moment in time like now. The change is staggering. It's really staggering. I believe in rule number one, and that's having fun. Yeah. Are you, are you having a good time with them? I do. I take life really seriously, but I married a really amazing woman who, when she met me, she said, uh, Brad, take the world really seriously, but talk, stop taking yourself so seriously. So it's helped me lighten up a little bit. Yeah. So, um, I've had too much coffee this morning, I don't know if I sound too sick. We'll get a couple of here. So let's go, let's go. Maybe we'll do some part with it later. Yeah. Uh, so, let's talk about, I'd like to look at it as yesterday, today, tomorrow. Um, so tell us maybe one of your favorite stories in the past, something that's, that was compelling. Well, in the news would not have existed if um, a top insider at the National Association of Realtors uh, some 20 years ago had called and tipped me off to a scandal. <laughs> and I don't know if it's a mini scandal, but uh, it had to do with an organization called RIN, which was developed by NAR. And this was a high-level executive that I kept on background all these years, but he was worried about the direction NAR was going with this, and he tipped me off. And I went to my editor at the San Francisco Examiner and said, I got this story about a scandal at the National Association of Realtors. And my editor said, you know, Brad, no one really cares. I don't even know what the National Association of Realtors is. It doesn't belong. And I was a consumer writing writer. I was writing for consumers um, before Inman started writing for the industry. And so at the same time, 1996, a friend of mine in public radio, which I used to do public radio, told me that there's this thing called the internet, the commercial internet. You ought to post that story on the internet. So, very early on blog, and what interesting happened, I posted it, and realtors are amazing. You know, they are so opportunistic, they're so curious, they're always looking for new information, new angles, because realtors, as I tell my journalists all the time, how about if I would have held your pay for three months, and I rewarded you based on how many readers? What if I didn't give you health insurance, dog insurance, and uh, maternity leave, and paternity leave, and grandparent leave, and you were on your own. That would be your life as a realtor. And I say that so they develop the same respect I have for the entrepreneurial nature of the everyday realtor. So I guess, and I love entrepreneurs too, that's why I love technology. And I always said realtors and entrepreneurs are just alike, their makeups are exactly the same. Um, that's why at every Connect conference before I start, I ask everybody who came there with their personal credit card to stand up and we give them a round of applause. And the people that stand up are entrepreneurs that start with nothing, that have to put the registration fee and the travel to get on their personal credit card, and the individual realtor who has to put in his personal credit card. But anyway, what happened then, guess what? There were realtors on the internet. And a lot of them at the time were Remax, because Remax and buyer's agents, because buyer's agents have a particular, peculiar DNA, as we all know, particularly back in the day. And those were the two groups of agents that saw this blog post, and they were really very supportive. And the reason
reason they were supported is the industry at the time was looking for independent information that they weren't getting from their trade group. And by the way, I think NAR does a great job, but the, the, the realtors were looking for independent information. And from there it grew. It grew to, you know, uh, we have a million readers in the industry now. And we touch a lot of people. Um, and they're very passionate. It's turned into a community along with being a best-selling publishing company. And I should give credit, I have a really amazing team. We hire first-rate journalists from good journalism schools. Um, we have really good editors. Um, we just brought out a whole group of new editors from, from places like Vox and uh, Vice even, and an amazing group of people that um, really care to report the news accurately. But in its genesis, it was a little bit of a scandal, which so I'm always grateful to the National Association of Realtors for. And that source still tips me off about stuff going on. It's always uh, finding and logging in great talent, and once you find them, that's, that's how the magic happens, right? Yeah. Execution, execution. Is this helpful for everybody so far? So far, so good? Uh, so let's talk about what's on everybody's minds, what we're reading almost on a daily basis, yeah. uh, what's happening today. So. Uh, there's big money coming into our industry, the real estate industry yeah. specifically. Uh, it's called Wall Street money. Is this new? And if it's not new, um, where do you kind of see this going? Well, look at a big level. I, I think Google, when it started, raised some $30 million. Um, and look at it today, you know, its market cap. I'm sure Apple was less than that. Microsoft certainly much less than that. Um, even if you look at Zillow, when it started, um, it raised millions. Now we have companies, you know, like Compass and Open Door, um, raising billions, you know, collectively. And so Uber-like rounds of funding. And you also have a new source of money, not just venture capital, but private equity. Because Wall Street likes to balance out its portfolio stocks and bonds and real estate's always been a great investment and Wall Street, if you think about it, has been in the real estate business a lot and uh, subprime, I think they were certainly involved. And uh, so they get in and they get out, um, they, they come in on the, on the good side and they, you know, you look at how they got into iBuying, um, they not only were behind the whole securitization of mortgages, but then they bought up the foreclosed homes and began to rent them. So they're working all angles with real estate, very sophisticated, smart people. And now they, through that experience, realize, wow, if this could be traded efficiently, there's an opportunity here. And there was really a crazy marriage going on here. I'm kind of separate the compasses and the red pin, and let's just talk about iBuy. You have this marriage of, of private equity and the Silicon Valley. And that hasn't happened too much. Um, and if you look what that's about is private equity wants to buy a lot of houses, which they call i buyers, and Wall Street also wants efficient marketplaces. They're used to the the stock exchanges where you can get you can push a button and transact and wire money and make commerce happen. And the Silicon Valley right now is obsessed with on demand and making things simple. And so it makes all the sense in the world that if Wall Street wants to tap into this and become a buyer of more real estate, the Silicon Valley would provide the means to provide a more efficient market. And take this the right way, man. But think of all the arcane legacy things we do in real estate that should be changed. And this has nothing to do with the well-purposed professional realtor. It has to do with a system that we just accept. It's kind of like family behavior that just goes on and on and on. You never change it even though you know you should. So selling my house. So I'm fortunate. I start with nothing, but I own a fair amount of real estate, and I love real estate. But let's just take my, I just bought a, a little house um, in Florida. Let's just say I decided to sell that house. So what would I do? I'd go to a top producer I know, and she would come to my house, and she would say, First grad signing exclusive. Here's my commission rate. Um, good news, I can have a broker open in two weeks, and that broker open, a bunch of strangers are gonna come to your house. I'm not gonna authenticate them. They're gonna sign a clipboard. They can sign 
Barbara Bush if they want it. Um, and they're going to go through your house. Oh, by the way, before we do that, Brad, take all of Yaz's expensive art out of the house. And I got a 26 year old um, um, stager who's going to come in with some IKEA furniture and, and make your house look, you know, like a commodity. Really look like shit. But, um, and, and then these brokers are going to go through your house. Oh, and then guess what? Great news, Brad. Three weekends in a row, complete strangers are going to go through your house and go through your bedroom and look in your drawers. And we're not going to authenticate or verify them at all. Um, is this a great deal? And by the way, I don't really know what price we'll get, but I think it's worth X. And if I don't sell it, there's no consequences, except you're left holding the bag. Good luck. Now, that's not how I'm talked to, but that's the process that we've accepted, that that's the way it should be done. And so we can continue to accept that, but what's happened now with iBuying is a whole group of very smart kids, and they don't have all the answers. They're going to make a lot of mistakes. They're going to stumble. They're going to blow it. But they come in with a new plan, and that new plan, instead of 72 days, Brad, 72 hours. All cash, you're done, you're out. Now, it's not for everybody, and we don't know what the price really is of that house until it sells. But if they get closer and closer to the true market value, including the estimate by a good realtor, or several realtors, then people like me are going to say, hmm, am I going to accept uncertainty, all of the noise, all the invasion of my privacy, all of this stuff, or am I going to consider, just like I did six years ago when Uber came to the Upper East Side, am I going to pay a little more with the certainty of that app of when my car is coming, when it'll arrive, and a lot of us are going to say yes. And what's being proven in the market is people are saying yes. And it's not just desperate situations. It's not one out of 100 buy your house. This is a more sophisticated set of technologies married with the cash of private equity. And I just wrote about it this weekend, and a lot of people were pissed off, but I gotta tell you, when I bought this house in Florida, the um, access to the house, it was empty. The house was empty. I should have been authenticated, like I was going through Homeland Security today with biometrics, images, which you can all do very soon here, which is what Open Door and Zillow are doing. Much better authentication than what's going on in the industry. Do a Google search and hope for the best when the person shows up. We should all be authenticated. Now, what did I have to do to get into that house? I had to call my realtor, who had to text the seller's agent, who was on a plane, who couldn't respond until he landed, who then texted his assistants, who then called my realtor, who then arranged for us to meet at this house. Okay, bullshit. That is not how it should work. I should be able to walk up to that door of a vacant house, authenticated like Homeland Security, like Clear, and I should be able to walk into that house and do what I needed to do. Which you know what I needed to do? Is check the cable line for Comcast. And in my article this week, I compared cord cutting to real estate. We need to cut the cord from these arcane, you know, legacy practices that are not consumer friendly. That took so much time of my agent and so much time of the seller's agent and his assistant just for one request to see a house. Those are the things that the outsiders are gonna bring to the industry. It's incumbent this time for the industry itself to adopt these things or you're gonna be doing this again about, oh Zillow, look what they did to our industry. And you're gonna say in five years, look what Open Door did to our industry. Or you can be at the forefront of all of these things and make them happen before other people do it. That's my, do I sound preachy? I don't need to be preachy. So, poor experience, too many steps. I respect process, so more efficiency coming. That's what yeah. we do, right? And it's uh, not tomorrow, don't sell your business and run away. Realtors are not going away. This is not about, every time I write a story like this, I say, why are you being so angry, realtors? Why are you saying that we're gonna go away? I never say that, and I'm not saying it now. And I believe that as well. And uh, we support the, them and, and support their success, and, and it's them first. Yeah, and if, I, if, if they go away, I don't have any readers, and I don't have any subscribers, right. and I'm screwed with stuff. So, by the way, we all, we all love you, right, Fred? 
But part of it is saying you need to change so you are around to come to this conference and my conference. And, and that's all that I, you know, and there's good agents and bad agents. The people in this room are good agents. So let's talk about just a couple more things before we go to the next topic. Um, is this statement fair that in this residential real estate business that we're all in, it's back to basics, keeping simple, it's fundamentals, right? It's this matters, right? This people relationship business. But at the same time, what I'm hearing, iBuyer is not going away, they fit. They fit. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Kubik. So it's not about cookies. My realtor keeps taking wanting me to go to lunch. They smell good. He wants to go to lunch. And I've got enough friends. I, I like him, but I don't really want to go to lunch with him. He, he wanted to send me champagne, and I said, give it to charity. What I want him to do is have docu sign. I want him to have emotional intelligence to know what I really want and what Dallas wants. I want him to have market intelligence. I want him to have the zip code 33480 and boss on his forehead. And I want him to have technology intelligence so he delivers me the tools. So not only do I save time, but he saves time so he can focus on the stuff that matters to me as a consumer. I don't need all the warm hugs and all that. I really don't. Others may. I'm not looking for a friend. I'm looking for a professional. And so spend your time there, and you're going to get my business. And I always use it. Always hustle, always work hard. Yeah. Make something happen automatically, right? Yeah. Awesome. So let's look into the future, maybe the near future, the next couple of years. Um, what's coming down down the path? So I buyers today. What do you see? For well, consolidation, uh, and all of this is good for the real estate industry. I think some of it may not be good. Um, let's take MLS consolidation. You know, we need to get to a national MLS database. You guys are paying way too many fees to multiple layers of bureaucracy, and the technology doesn't work that well. And, then, and by the way, you are the taxpayers of the MLSs and the trade associations, so stand up and scream for the things that you deserve. And consolidation in MLS isn't taking anything away from localization. All it's saying, is there's a very inefficient system and a lot of victims and a lot of people, you know, they're just way too many, they're all paying for it. So those are the kind of things that are happening in consolidation. There's also consolidation under a few brands. Um, you know, you look at what's going on with Compass. There's an example of a ton of money and they're making lots of acquisitions. Robert Rafkin in New York at our conference said he's not gonna go um, do any more acquisitions and then have, Two weeks later, he announced a lot to now. So I think what he meant was um, the 20 or 30 markets they're in, they're going to go deeper. But in those markets, which are the biggest markets, they're going to make more acquisitions. You're seeing consolidation of teams. I think around the bend, teams are going to be, they're fashionable now. But like most things fashionable, they run out of steam. But if you look at what teams are about, it's the agents understanding the consolidation wins, and it's why you look at everything going on with, let's, let's take cable again. Why is cable consolidated? Because they realize they can't innovate themselves, so they're buying share. And so you see a lot of companies buying share because they don't have the means or the capacity to innovate. You know, the key now is either you consolidate to get share, you, you, with teams you're getting more people to conquer the beast together, and if you can't do that, if you can't consolidate, then you have to innovate. I mean, I don't know if you know, Zillow just went through a major pivot, major pivot. And here's a company that's, what, only 15 years old. And why would it be faced with the innovator's dilemma? Well, guess what? Open door is a big threat to Zillow. The second thing with Zillow's pivot, and yesterday we just reported Realtor.com as well, guess where they're going? They're all going after the commission. Um, and they're going up after the commission through something that's very acceptable to all of you, which is a reward base. You send me a lead, I'll pay you 25, 30, 35%. But at the end of the day, the digital marketing opportunity of $12 billion wasn't big enough for them, and they're looking at the $80 billion commission prize, and they're gonna institutionalize what you're all familiar with, which is a referral fee and so that's a big change. Technology, get ready, gang. It's virtual showings. 
biometrics, authentication. So you as agents know who you're dealing with. You're not gonna go out and show a listing in the middle of a cornfield to a stranger with one Google search. This person will be authenticated just like they go through Homeland Security. It also means smart contracts, it means instant offers, it means uh, smart closings. There's a revolution in the mortgage market game. If you look at what's going on in mortgages, they're not innovating fast enough, so there's a parallel mortgage market being created. If you look at open doors, access to private equity, they're really providing, in an essence, a mortgage. And there's all kinds of new things going on with mortgage. So I call it fast in theory is a more certain, a faster, and a more opaque, or more transparent transaction. Those are the big changes ahead. Um, at the end of the day, next year, year after, year after, year after, will a realtor be grinding out the sale? Yes. Will they be important in the transaction? Yes. Will their role evolve? Of course. It's evolved in the last 20 years. Um, but those are some of the changes. Awesome. I'm so long-winded here, aren't I? Wow, you're doing terrific. You're doing terrific. So before I go out to the crowd and, and to our awesome professionals to ask a couple of questions, there's one yeah. final question I want to ask yeah. you. It is summit tradition to take a selfie from the stage with the group, oh, the great. attendees in the background. Fantastic. Is that okay? Oh, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. They get to look at our ass. Is that how <laughs> Yeah, right. <correct. laughs> Camouflage them. 
And on top of that, you have dual agency, which in my personal opinion makes everything twice as bad. You have pocket listings. You have bad behavior and institutional pranks that I think is what drags these lawsuits into motion. The industry always has a chance to fight things and call everybody names and try to put an end to it. And they should do that. But kind of like when these things like the portals emerge, people just spent way too much time fighting it and not taking the initiative themselves and now they don't like it. Here similarly, I would say NAR will fight it and probably should fight it, but NAR should also begin to require the transparency that the consumer deserves. Because if this, saw, this lawsuit fails, others are to follow. And the door is opening for these kind of things. So you can either clean up your act, or you can show up to the party all dirty, and eventually people are going to bite you back. Thank you, Brett. So a couple more questions. Here's one right here. Your name, sir? Uh, Eddie Storch. <laughs> hey, Eddie. Hey, hey Brett, how are you? Um, hey. As an organization, you look around this room, probably got the size we were last year. Actually, I probably think more than that when we saw the hands raised. We're projected to double the hands of the company in just 12 months. We've gone from 15 to 36 states in Canada in the last 18 months, including a couple more countries that we'll get. Have you ever seen a traditional brand, you know, not a virtual company, a traditional brand, grow this rate? And I'd like to hear your, uh, you know, maybe some advice to all of us to use to make sure you weren't a set growth rate. Right way. Yeah, well, not traditional. Uh, brick and mortar, full service. Correct. Thank well, you. Not a discount <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. you know, realtors have always had incredible power to choose where they go because of the independent contractor status. And consequently, if someone comes around and offers something more compelling and convincing and persuasive, the agents will jump ship. And I think agents have all the power. If you look about it around, everybody's chasing the pocketbook of the realtor. Everybody. And the realtor is the prize in the puzzle right now. And I always say realtors have survived all the innovation and disruption because they just outwork everybody. And uh, so I would say companies that are growing fast, um, and there's quite a few of them now, have a value proposition that realtors really love. And I think that is evolving as well. Um, you know, the branded franchises are struggling. What is the value of a brand when Zillow is the consumer brand? And, and think about that, Zillow as the brand. People actually, when they're going to go search real estate, type in Zillow instead of real estate. It's also a brand of habit. Unlike, say, Century 21, where there's brand awareness, I'm not punching in Century 21 twice or three times a day. That brand of habit is so powerful. So, you know, these fast growing companies need to figure out how they fit into that system where the realtor now suddenly is dependent on a lot of characters and a lot of people are after their pocketbook. And I think it's the value proposition. Obviously, Cooper and Dan have figured that out for all of you. Thank you. Uh, Brad, by the way, these are my beautiful parents, my beautiful oh, wife, and hello. it is some tradition to tease my mom. Do you have a question? She's very shy. She's very shy. <laughs> I would give anything in the world if my parents were sitting right here. In fact, I used to go speak, and my dad and mom would show up and sit right over here. And I buried them here in Las Vegas. They moved from Illinois to Palm Springs. And when my dad turned 80, he called me one day and he said, Bradley, too many old people are moving to Palm Springs. We're going to Vegas. <laughs> and their last 10 years, I mean, the last two were the shits, but their 10 years in Vegas were amazing. And uh, so it, 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 that hits me right here. So just in case my parents uh, decide to move to uh, Vegas, anybody know of a realtor? <laughs> Gotcha. And I'll say, gotcha. okay, my parents were small town retailers, so that's why I also like realtors, because they were small businesses, and that's where I was brought up. But we worked, you know, hanging dresses, as my dad marked them up three times before Walmart came to town. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you. One final question. Yes. Please come to you. Your name? I'm Mona. My name is Mona Sosa. I'm from Los Angeles. 
and I would like to know what is your opinion on the reverse mortgage market and the servicers? Because I don't think they are servicing their market. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. When I was a consumer writer, I wrote a lot about it, and uh, I think, you know, people earn their equity, and uh, they earn it by putting down a down payment, paying off the mortgage, and weathering you know, the ups and downs of marketplaces. And I don't think that that market has ever figured out how to offer a consumer product that is safe and secure for the consumer. So if that's your point, I would, I would agree with you. Um, do we have one more now? Oh, I work with another face. Good morning. Um, your name, sir? Andrew, good morning. Hey, good morning, Brad. Hey. Uh, I get a lot of my insight about what's changing in the industry and how fast it's changing by attending the uh, Connect conference. I know that this year it's here in Vegas. Is there anything you can share us, with us about the conference that maybe hasn't been announced yet? Um, bigger, bolder, <laughs> um, same community feel, but just a lot more people based on the registration so far. Um, we're, we're serious is in. We're going to have entertainment, but. There's a lot of serious stuff going on in the industry, and we really want to do our best to explain all of these things, which we try to do in the news service every day. But I'd say that's a glimpse. We got some great speakers lined up. Some, um, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna go five days. It's broken into all kinds of different creative pieces of the puzzle. Awesome. One final question. Yes. Good. So Barbara Baker is our first franchisee who took a first leap of faith six years ago. Thank you. Thank you for believing in me. Ten Five. years. Wow, that's a long time. Yes. Six plus ten. Thank you. Thank you. It's been the ride of our life. I've been in the business since 1975, and yes, I was not 12. Yeah. <laughs> but I do have a question. It has been the most ex exciting, joyful experience that my husband Clark and I have had in my, all my years of real estate. Here is a man who not only has the brain, but he has the heart, and that is an amazing combination. But I do have a question for you. I'm in the Temecula, California area, and we have encountered the open house scenario. And what we have found is that the people that are using it are putting the houses up thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars before fair market value. So what does that do to our marketplace? You say the buyers are paying that much less. Yeah, I haven't heard that number. I've heard you know eight or nine. Percent. I don't know what the percent is. I should have. So like 10%? Yeah. Yeah, I think what's going to happen, I've written about this recently, I think the algorithms estimate value, which are very controversial now, like the Zestin. Uh, in fact, Zillow didn't invent that. We invented that at home game, a company I started and sold. But the, the science and technology behind it is getting better and better and better and better. And it's my prediction that this algorithm will be adopted by everybody in the industry, including everybody in this room. And whatever that algorithm is, and whoever produces it, that I as a seller will be told pretty close, maybe 5% off, what the house could ultimately get. And I know this feels uncomfortable, but I think it's where it's headed. And kind of like in a national MLS, there will be some uniform prediction of price. And there will be 